Okay, we're good to go. Uh, hey, everybody. Good afternoon or good morning. Um, we are starting the key seminar of Ivan Agullo. I met uh, I met Ivan at a summer school in uh, and he taught a short course in quantum field theory and it was an amazing enlightening talk. So I'm very much looking forward to this presentation. So Ivan, if you're ready, you can start sharing the screen and your presentation. Thank you, Andrea. It's a pleasure to, to be here. And uh, so thank you, you and Marius and everybody in QISS for uh, uh, giving me the chance to, to speak here. As, as Andrea said, this is a peculiar uh, uh, seminar series because of the format. So, uh, you know, I was given instructions to have, you know, to give a short talk uh, with few details uh, just to provoke discussions. And, and this is wonderful. <laughs> I love this because, you know, that means that they will benefit from this talk pro probably more than you <laughs> because of comments and, and feedback. So please, please uh, uh, provide any comment and feedback. Stop me at any point. Uh, because of the format, my, my presentation has very few technical details. Even could can seem too simple, but you know, the calculations are you know, behind the, uh, the, the screen. So if you are interested, uh, you stop me and I can give more technical details, but you know, I was hoping to give you, you know, the overview, focus on ideas and, 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 you know, and initiate a discussion. So this is what this should be. So uh, let me uh, share my screen and, and my presentation. Um, um, so I think you can see it, right? Good. So I want to talk about, you know, something having to do with entanglement in field theory, you know, with a motivation based on the early universe, inflation, etc. And I am just the messenger here, so don't kill the messenger, remember? Uh, this is work in collaboration with several people, you know, several students, Patricia, uh, Sergi, and, and Dimitris, and, and, and a more senior colleague, uh, Beatrice Bonga. And it's fair to say that Patricia is the main uh, architect of, of all what I'm going to say. Uh, so hopefully I will, I will, I will uh, be accurate. <laughs> and correct with, with uh, what I have to say. But Patricia, of course, you are uh, more than welcome to contribute and to correct me if needed. So, um, you know, uh, motivation, why I want to speak about this, you know. If you want the main motivation behind my, uh, 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 these calculations is, you know, the early universe. Uh, you know, we have this theory of inflation, which is one of the leading proposals to explain the origin of cosmic structures and the standard story that we are told in courses is that, you know, if you have an exponential expanding universe that creates quanta out of the vacuum in pairs with opposite momenta, so, so total momentum is conserved because homogeneity. And this quanta, uh, you know, uh, uh, seed primordial perturbations that are the origin of the large uh, scale structure that we see in the universe. And that is mind blowing, right? You know, all what we see in the universe is coming from vacuum fluctuations and, and that, that is completely uh, amazing. And even more amazing is the fact that mathematically this process of particle creation is precisely a two mode squeezing process. So the initial vacuum translates, you know, uh, evolves to a two mode squeeze vacuum. So these particles are entangled in a very precise manner. So, you know, you have here quantum field theory, quantum information, cosmology, and the entire universe uh, together. And I think this is, this is fascinating and has rich physics. But if you go to the details and also you speak with cosmologists, in my opinion, there seems to be that dichotomy in the, uh, 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 in the community. If you talk to theorists, theorists will put, you know, will say what I just said, I am a theorist. Cosmic structures come from quantum fluctuations and quantum in capital letters, you know, squeezing, entanglement, quantum. But if you talk to people doing observations, sorry for the typo, it should be observations, uh, no end there. Uh, they say, uh, quantum what? Uh, all what we do is, you know, is classical. All what we use to analyze observations is classical physics. 
uh, uh, in particular, you know, they use a classical probability distribution to characterize the CMB fluctuations, and they find no contradiction with observations. So they say quantum what? Uh, so there seems to be a dichotomy between you know what theories are saying and what we see in the sky. And this brings questions that many people have uh, answered. These are not only my questions, uh, is the way I phrase them. Uh, what is genuinely quantum in the primordial perturbations at the end of inflation? I want to put myself at the end of inflation because, you know, I mean, just try to be as simple as possible. After inflation, there is a lot of rich physics and the coherence could happen by interactions with other fields. You know, just let's put ourselves in the simplest situation. The end of inflation, what is quantum in the primordial perturbations and what is not? Why the CMB looks so classical then? If the origin is quantum, you know, what happens with the quantum features? Where are they? Is there any way we can test using observations this big statement that, that primordial perturbations have a quantum origin? You know, is there anything we can use to confirm or refute this uh, beautiful uh, uh, idea. So this is the motivation of all what I'm going to say. Uh, 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 and I'm gonna give partial answers or, or, or indications. By no means I'm gonna answer all these questions in a precise manner, but this is where you know, the questions are interesting to, uh, to me. Um, so if you go to the literature, of course, a lot of papers have been devoted to discuss this. And in fact, there is a curious debate about the role of squeezing and quantumness of primordial perturbations. As I said, for a theorist, uh, you, know, you know, the creation of perturbations is a squeezing process, two mode squeezing process. So pe different people have different opinions about what is the role of squeezing in the quantumness of of primordial perturbations. Uh, let me just, you know, very simplified manner, um, uh, uh, show you the two main lines of thought in the literature. The first line of thought comes from Kiefer, Sarovinsky, Polarsky. They have several papers. This is just one of them. And they argue in, in essence that the CMB looks so classical precisely because squeezing. This squeezing is, 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 is the reason why the universe, you know, the, the primordial perturbations, sorry, uh, 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 are for us uh, so classical, look for us so classical. Not everybody agrees with this line of thought, uh, 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 not even myself, uh, but recently uh, there is an a, a interesting paper by Bay Look Who and collaborators uh, you know, just a few months ago. Uh, and let me just, you know, copy a piece of the abstract. So you see the main, the main ideas. Um, you know, let me read it. Uh, a dominant view which has propagated for a quarter of a century uh, asserts yes, based on the belief that the large squeezing of quantum state after a duration of inflation renders the system classical. This paper debunks this view by identifying the technical fault lines in this derivation and revealing the pitfalls in its argument which drew early authors to this wrong conclusion. We use a few simple quantum mechanical models to expound where the fallacy originated. I mean, uh, they are a bit strong, but, but I think it's quite clear uh, 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 that they disagree with, with, with this view. And it's up to you to read both papers and decide which line of thought you prefer. In a more concrete manner, uh, you know, uh, uh, Jerome Martin and, and, and Benin and, and they have, and collaborators, they have a series of papers. This is just one of them. Uh, very nice papers, easy to read um, and, and very thoughtful that they argue the opposite. They say that the squeezing, because it comes with entanglement, uh, uh, you know, uh, it should make primordial perturbations very quantum. And, and they argue that the quantumness should be there somewhere because, because the squeezing causes quantumness. So you see, you know, completely orthogonal uh, ideas. 
Um, and again, it's up to you to read both and decide. Uh, uh, I have read both <laughs> and decide. And that was the motivation for me and Beatrice and Patricia to wrote this paper recently uh, about the squeezing, you know, about, you know, how much squeezing and therefore entanglement happens in perturbations. This, is, this paper is a bit tangential to what I want to say today. So I just want to tell you quickly the messages, uh, the, 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 the messages, uh, uh, but, but not entering into discussions. Because this paper, as, as the previous ones, focus on Fourier space. All previous discussions have been trying to analyze squeezing and entanglement in Fourier space. And our view is that uh, uh, Fourier space is a, a false enemy, <laughs> you know, so a false friend. <laughs> uh, uh, it's, not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not easy to obtain um, uh, 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 well-defined or, or definitive statements using Fourier modes, uh, because the question of how much squeezing or entanglement is generated in Fourier space, we argue, is ambiguous in Korf space times. The idea is that particle creation comes with a squeezing and entanglement. But as you know, uh, uh, in Korf space times, in space times which are not time symmetric, uh, the definition of particles is ambiguous. And there is a huge ambiguity in the number of particles created. You can choose your notion of particles always in such a way that no particles are created if the space time is not asymptotically flat. Uh, therefore, we argue there is ambiguity in the amount of squeezing or entanglement uh, uh, that comes together with the ambiguity in the notion of particle. And we argue, therefore, that the answer to, to, to this question does not make cosmological perturbations more or less quantum if you work in Fourier space. And now the motivation for this talk. We argue that it is more fruitful to focus on what we can actually see in the CMB. We cannot see Fourier modes. Fourier modes are extended along the entire cosmos. We can measure in real space. We can measure, you know, the field there. This is what the Planck satellite is doing, you know, there, 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 there. And therefore, I find more fruitful for observations to focus on those observables we can access to. So the goal of this talk is to analyze this, focus on what we can measure and evaluate how much entanglement there is on those observables. So therefore, uh, uh, my goal is to quantify entanglement in real space uh, in the context of inflation, but also in Minkowski space time and try, try to quantify it somehow. So I'm going to start with Minkowski space time um, um, to show you what we have done so far. This is work in progress. So, so you know, um, um, I'm sure that you have good suggestions. Um, so Minkowski space time. Uh, of course, we are not the first one <laughs> trying to quantify entanglement uh, in, in field theory. Absolutely not. There are hundreds, thousands of papers. So, so this is just you know, one more contribution. So let me summarize what, what, what has been done. Um, to my understanding. Uh, you know, consider Minkowski spacetime here in a plane, but it's three dimensional if you want. Consider a, a free a scalar field, massive or massless, uh, whatever you like, and put the field in the Minkowski vacuum. Uh, then um, uh, 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 it is very well known that the degrees of freedom in, you know, take two regions, region A and the complement. It is very well known that the degrees of freedom inside A are entangled with the rest of the degrees of freedom, you know, with, with those in B. Uh, how is that quantified? That is quantified using what is called geometric entropy or entanglement entropy. And the calculation is you take A, you take the reduced state for subsystem A and you compute the entropy. And because the total state is pure, that entropy can be interpreted uh, or is a quantifier for the entanglement of both systems. So system A is mixed because there is entanglement with B. Uh, uh, and that entropy is claimed to be different from zero. zero. Uh, 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 therefore, there is entanglement. 
the problem is that that if that that entropy is infinite <laughs> and and because you know it because it's infinite and 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 uh, 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 and therefore you know the question is you know what happens with this infinity uh, uh, i think people agree that there is entanglement no question about that but you know uh, this infinity is somehow uncomfortable and this infinity in my opinion is more tricky than other infinities that appear you know for instance, when you compute the energy or, or, or energy momentum tensor, uh, this is more tricky to remove in a covariant and local manner. Uh, uh, and to me, you know, one important question uh, for me for many, you know, many years was, okay, is there any way to regularize or renormalize uh, the, ent the entanglement entropy uh, in a similar way as we do with the energy momentum tensor? Um, the justification for this infinity, physical justification, is that both systems, A and B, have infinitely many degrees of freedom. This is a field theory, and there are infinitely many degrees of freedom with A and within A and B. This one is in, this, this entropy is infinite. And this also uh, uh, led to a resolution, uh, 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 at least a resolution of this infinity that I know and, and I think is, is, is the right way of solving this. Um, I found the resolution in a paper by Eugenio, who is here in the audience, and, and, and Alejandro. Very nice paper, you all of you should read. And, and the idea is, you know, uh, we cannot access infinitely many degrees of freedom. <laughs> Why don't we focus on a finite number of them and compute the entanglement entropy? And let's see if it is finite or not. This infinite is an artifact of considering at once infinitely many degrees of freedom. So they did this calculation in a, in a very nice manner. So let me show you how this goes, because I'm going to use similar tools. Two steps. Step one is how to extract individual degrees of freedom out of the field. And the answer is this process of smearing. Let me tell you what a smearing is in case you don't know. So consider a function of compact support within the region uh, uh, A, a single function of compact support. Uh, um, um, physically, this function is going to play the role of the sensitivity of a one pixel detector, right? Imagine you have a field detector, and this is one pixel of your detector, but your detector has more sensitivity in the center of the pixel than in the borders. So this function, you know, uh, indicates, you know, how sensitive is your, your detector. Then what you can do is you can integrate the field against the function. And therefore, you don't have a field anymore. You have just a single uh, uh, quantity. And this is called the smeared uh, field. You can do the same with the momentum. And therefore, and then you can compute uh, the commutator between phi and pi, or classically Poisson bracket, whatever you want. And you realize that this uh, uh, the commutator of these two guys is just given by, by the L squared norm of the function. So if the function is normalized, uh, this is just canonical commutation relations. Therefore, mathematically, this couple forms a pair of canonically conjugate operators. And physically, this pair constitutes one degree of freedom of the field. So by doing this smearing, you are extracting a single, you are fishing a single degree of freedom inside region A, the degree of freedom associated to the smearing function. Of course, there are infinitely many degrees of freedom because there are infinitely many orthogonal functions of compact support. So, you know, using different functions, you can fish different uh, degrees of freedom inside, inside A. This is one of them. One, uh, 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 you know, two-dimensional phase space, one physical degree of freedom. And then uh, second step in, in, in this paper is to compute the entanglement between uh, this degree of freedom and the rest of, uh, of the field theory. How? You take the Minkowski vacuum, you compute the reduced state associated to that degree of freedom. Uh, it's a mixed state, you can check it, and you can compute its entropy. 
So its entropy is non-zero. Therefore, as I said, is, is, uh, this reduced state is a mixed state telling you that there is entanglement between this single degree of freedom and the rest of the field theory. And more important is finite. So here you have it. Here you have a very physical regularization of the entanglement entropy, telling you that individual degrees of freedom uh, are entangled with the rest in a finite manner. This is the resolution I was mentioning uh, before. And to me, this is this resolution. Um, 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 very nice. Uh, now I want to go one step beyond and say that, you know, still <laughs> this is the entanglement between a single degree of freedom and infinitely many inside and outside the region A. Uh, 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 so um, it is difficult to <clears throat> do physics with it because subsystem B has a still infinitely many degrees of freedom. So what I want to do is to compute entanglement between individual degrees of freedom or between a bunch of them. So have both subsystem A and B both having finitely, finitely many degrees of freedom. <clears throat> so this is the end of the motivation. Now I start with uh, this new calculation entanglement between a finite number of degrees of freedom in field theory. Um, um, <clears throat> so I start with Minkowski. <clears throat> so I'm going to do two such as meetings. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Each of them is going to fish a single degree of freedom of the field, one operator, conjugate momentum, twice. And then I'm going to, uh, uh, you know, my, if you want the, the intuitive Sorry. picture I have, Can is I there a question? Please, please. So, uh, <clears throat> you know, I mean, don't you already know, like from the Busso bound, for instance, that um, any region of space has a finite number of degrees of freedom? No, uh, any region of space has infinitely many degrees of freedom uh, in a field theory without, without any cutoff. Uh, uh, and they are one way of counting them is by taking a basis of, of an orthogonal basis of functions of compact support within the region. Each, each function of compact support will fish an independent degree of freedom uh, 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 from the field. No, I'm. I'm talking about, let's say, you know, you're talking the Bekenstein Hawking bound, right? The Bekenstein Hawking bound tells us that the maximum possible entropy or which one can associate with a given region, right, is given by the uh, area of the boundary of that region, right? right? So the understanding that is normally, you know, associated with that is that there is a finite number of degrees of freedom. In my opinion, that is not supported by calculations in field theory. If you take, if you compute entanglement entropy, it's infinite. Well, and if you count, um, right. So there must be, you know, in the final theory, there, there must be something that makes that finite. But, but, but that, that is not, uh, my understanding is that that is not itself within the field theory. Okay. I'll, I'll type my remaining questions in the chat. Um, 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 I am very bad reading the chat <laughs> while I am speaking, so so feel free to, to speak. And if somebody else has an opinion on this, please please go ahead. Um, um. So um, my motivation is, you know, physical picture is that you know, imagine you pixelized uh, 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 the space uh, in pixels given by the resolution of your detector, and your detector is sensitive to a single degree of freedom uh, inside each pixel. So each pixel is, you know, is single degree of freedom fished by your detector. And I want to know how much entanglement there is between different pixels when the field is in the Minkowski vacuum. So this is this is what I am trying, I am trying to do here. The pixels, you know, the degree of freedom is given by the function that I, I am free to choose, which depends on my detector. And so I want to compute entanglement between different pixels. And this is what I'm going to do. One technical point is that um, if you take two such pixels, <laughs> you know, like in this in this picture, the reduced state for A and B together is a mixed state. Why? Because A and B are entangled with other degrees of freedom I am tracing 
tracing out. So even if the total state is pure, the reduced state for A and B is mixed. Therefore, the entropy of A is not a quantifier for entanglement between A and B. Remember, for entanglement only when the total state of the system, in this case, AB, is pure. So that is not the case. In this case, the entropy will know about both entanglement, but also about the entropy of A itself uh, and B itself. So we need to find a different quantifier uh, 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 for entanglement. Entanglement entropy is not, is not a good quantifier in this case. But you know, in the quantum info literature, there is a huge amount of, 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 of proposals for quantifier. One that, that I think is convenient at the theoretical level is this logarithmic negativity, log neck. As many other quantifiers, this is based on the uh, PPT criterion, you know, the positivity of the partial transpose. Uh, 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 and this is A, convenient, and B, quite uh, good whenever the state of the system is Gaussian, as it is in this case, even the reduced state is Gaussian. And in particular, if one of the subsystem has a single degree of freedom, this is, you know, this quantity is, uh, you know, is a good quantifier. You know, it's an entanglement monotone. There is entanglement if and only if uh, 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 log negativity is zero. Again, that is only true when the state is Gaussian and one subsystem has a single mode, no matter how big is the other one. <clears throat> and I'm going to use that for my calculations. <clears throat> So let me start with something, something simple. One plus one dimensional space time. Uh, I'm gonna choose a family of, 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 of functions of compact support given by this expression. You know, uh, the, the details are not important. This is just the shape in the R coordinate uh, uh, centered at zero, but you can move it wherever you want. So it's just a family of, of functions of compact support uh, uh, with different, you know, smooth, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, smoothness uh, properties given by this parameter delta. So delta gives you how smooth is the function. Delta equals zero is simply a um, um, square uh, top hat function, but if you has larger delta, it is a smoother and a smoother. So if you see different deltas in my in my plots later on, that means just different uh, functions of compact support. And this is the calculation. We have two regions, A and B, one dimension. We have this function of compact support. Uh, here and here, they extract a single degree of freedom from A and B. <clears throat> and we want to compute entanglement between them when the system, total system, is in the Minkowski vacuum uh, 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 for a massive field, because for a massless field, is you know um, everything is divergent in the infrared. So you need to introduce a mass in one dimension as a function of the dimensionless distance, the distance in units of, of the size of the system. And, and we compute first, just to give you some intuition, the correlations, you know, how much correlations in the field and the conjugate momenta. We obtain correlations in the field, fall off logarithmically with the distance as you expect. So just to make sure our calculation is, 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 is fine, we find this uh, a logarithmic fall off of the two point correlation between fields. We also compute the mutual information between the two systems. Remember, mutual information contains, you know, is a measure of total correlations, uh, uh, quantum, classical, everything. And mutual information falls off as one over the distance. And then entanglement. Entanglement, you know, log negativity within the two regions is different from zero, so they are entangled. And they, you know, fall off quite fast with the distance. And of course, the details depend on the smidding function you choose. Depending on the function that you choose, you have different values, but there are many for which it's different from zero and falls off very quickly with, with, with the distance. 
So wonderful. Here you have, you know, the Minkowski vacuum in one dimension of space time is highly entangled. And here you can see it just considering two degrees of freedom. So, so this makes me happy because I see, I see, you know, this entanglement, you know, in a simple system with a finite number of degrees of freedom. What about two plus one space time dimensions? So if we increase the dimensionality of a space. We repeat the calculation with two regions. Now they are two circles and a, a two dimensional function of compact support. Again, we compute correlations. They fall off as one over uh, uh, you know, the two point function as one over the distance. We know that it, that should be the case. So this is a good check. Mutual information fall offs as one over distance square but no entanglement. Log negativity is zero. No matter how close the two regions are. So no matter you know, where you put the two regions, no matter the family of functions of compact support we have considered, we see no entanglement. Intuition. Entangle, entanglement must be there in the field theory, but because now you have more degrees of freedom, entanglement is more sparse. And just with two degrees of freedom, we are not able to capture that entanglement. Uh, 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 uh. Perhaps we need more degrees of freedom to catch it. Uh, uh, with two, we have been unable to capture any entanglement. So we have tried other configurations. So the, you know, the message, my message is entanglement is there probably in the field theory. No, no probably is there, as I will show you in a second, but it's more sparse than in one plus one dimensions. This is, this is, this is the message of this calculation. So other configurations. What about if we have subsystem A made of you know, uh, uh, the orange circles, subsystem B made of blue circles, you know, way more degrees of freedom, uh, n degree of freedom in each subsystems and you know trying to maximize the contact between the two subsystems you know just just as a, as a game is there entanglement here uh, uh, the answer is yes <laughs> yes as as long as we consider more than four degrees of freedom in each subsystem you know when the two subsystems are big enough entanglement appears and it is bigger, the more subsystems, uh, 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 you know, the more degrees of freedom we include, you know, log negativity in the vertical axis as a number of degrees of freedom in each subsystem, N. And this increases as we consider bigger and bigger systems. So entanglement is there in two dimensions, but it's not so easy to catch compared to one dimension. And then we have play with configurations, you know, you know, these other configurations, you know, two degrees of freedom, no entanglement, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, this configuration, no entanglement. With this configuration, we find entanglement. <laughs> and then more entanglement with, with this. You know, this is A, a single degree of freedom, and B, we are increasing the number of degrees of freedom in B to see what happens. And as we go beyond four degrees of freedom in B, entanglement appears. It grows as we grow B, but eventually saturates to a maximum value. You can keep adding degrees of freedom in B, but they are too, too far away from, the, from A. So they, are not, they don't add more entanglement. So, so entanglement saturates in this particular configuration. We have checked uh, also this, you know, this configuration. Uh, 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 a orange blue uh, is B as an entanglement as a function of the distance. You know, as you as you increase the distance, an entanglement falls off in a concrete manner with the distance. We have also done this calculation. You know, just two big uh, uh, subsystems and entanglement as a function of the distance between them and try to separate them. And entanglement falls off very fast with the distance, exponentially fast with a large exponent. So entanglement is there. And in this way, you can quantify the way it, it, it behaves. Um, um, 
So let me make contact with previous calculations done in lattice field theory. You may know that something similar has been done before using lattice field theory. There is a bunch of papers by these authors, very nice papers, uh, 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 easy to read also, and, and very interesting. Uh, maybe there are more, but this is what the ones I, I, I know. Uh, and what they do is they consider a lattice uh, in two dimensions. Each point is a degree of freedom. So, so the, the quantum theory, the field theory is discretized. And Ivan, can and I ask a quick question? Of course. Uh, so in the previous plots, which you showed us, what's the smearing function? Yes, in this uh, um, is uh, the same smearing function I had before, uh, but... Um, 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 so this is meaning function, uh, right. a function of, if, if you work in a spherical coordinates, uh, uh, of course, you know, it's, it's uh, symmetric under rotations, but, but in the radius, it falls off. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we have tried many different, this is just a family we have considered. And we have analytical calculations. All, all calculations are analytical in two dimensions. Uh, and that was for a massless field, I forgot to mention. For a massless field, you can do all these calculations analytically. With this, is meaning functions. Okay, so These meaning functions are nice to deal with, and they depend on this free parameter delta. And as I said, the larger delta is, the more the, the smoother, you know, the differentiability of the function is given by delta. Uh, uh, and it's good because the Fourier transform is a Bessel function. So it is, it is very convenient to do uh, analytical calculations. Uh, and, and again, you know, Patricia uh, was, was the main, uh, I mean, not the main, was the one who came out with this with these nice functions and, and did all these analytical calculations. Yeah, so the reason I'm asking this is what, what was the delta? Because when you showed us the one dimensional plots uh, towards uh, the, the one with entanglement versus distance, it seemed that the, uh, the sharper, yeah, so that, the plot before then, uh, um, for the one dimensional one, uh, the one delta dimensional to, one, uh, yes. Yeah, this one. Yes. So it seems like some of them are still zero. Uh, show you zero entanglement uh, for some of the choices of delta, whereas right, like you have a large amount of entanglement for delta equals one, for instance. Right. Th th thank you. Thank you. The, uh, this is because this plot is cut at, at distance equal two. If you go to a smaller distance, these other deltas also have entanglement. Right. But so when you do the two dimensional one, do you choose like this kind of sharp delta equals one cutoff, or do you use like the smoother ones, or does that make any difference? That that was my main question. Uh, something similar happens. We we have done the calculation with 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 many deltas, and of course the value of entanglement depends on the delta because it depends on the degree of freedom you are fishing, mm -hmm. uh, but the behavior doesn't. So this is why so we are showing. N does not depend on delta. Like what n you get a minimum entanglement for? Like you said, n equals four or something. This does not depend on the choice of delta, does it? I don't think so. Patricia can okay. can 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 correct me, but I I don't think so. I okay. think the minimum. That was my end, uh, so Patricia, if I am wrong, uh, 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 let me know. But my understanding is that uh, 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 here we all I only show one delta, but 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 uh, 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 I think the qualitative features are delta independent. Okay, thank you. Thank yes, you. Uh, that is correct. Um, this particular case, uh, well, it doesn't really matter and about the first um, plot that you were asking about. The thing is, we also have a choice of a mass and mm -hmm. that also enters into these plots. Uh, so for a smaller mass, we have, let's say, uh, more functions that have a larger entanglement, let's say. Okay. Thank you. In one dimension, you need to introduce a mass. Otherwise, everything is infrared divergent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In two dimensions, you don't need to introduce a mass. You can if you want. Uh, Thanks. Thank you, Ivan. So, um, was... so it's been it's been just uh, over forty minutes. So you've been interrupted okay. a few times, and we started later. But just to okay. Just to so I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap up uh, very soon. Um, um, because there are questions in the middle, so this is part of the discussion. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So there's no problem. There's no problem. We can take ten more minutes. Or okay. Um, I, I'm gonna uh, try to finish it. So lattice field theory. So this is what they do. They consider a bunch of you know two subsystems with a bunch of degrees of freedom. They consider very large n, and they measure and compute entanglement as a function of the distance, and they obtain it falls off exponentially fast with an exponent in two dimensions, and they guess that in three dimensions, the result should be the same with a different exponent. Uh, so our calculations 
uh, uh, differ in the sense that we find entanglement falls off much faster than what they what, what lattice field theories uh, indicate uh, significant exponentially but 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 much faster than you know this this would be the fall off of entanglement induced by lattice calculations and this is what we find of course we cannot go to super high number of degrees of freedom we maximum number we have been able to compute so far is 266 uh, uh, but my guess is that this strong fall off uh, is, 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 is there even for bigger systems. And my guess is that the difference with lattice field theories is that in, in continuous field theories, you know, you have many more degrees of freedom and therefore entanglement is, 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 this is, is way more sparse than, than in lattice field theories. So lattice field theories uh, are unable to capture, you know, how fast entanglement is diluted uh, in the continuous uh, field theories. So it's an indication, but 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 but, but not enough. Uh, three dimensions. This is very fast. No entanglement falls so far in any configuration we have explored so far. So in three dimensions, you know, we have started with you know two degrees of freedom. We compute correlations. Uh, we compute mutual information. Fall off in the way it should be but no entanglement for this configuration. We have considered this configuration, these configurations with a huge number of degrees of freedom, these configurations, you know, all what we have been able to imagine, no entanglement at all. So, so we have been fighting, <laughs> you know, no entanglement in any of the configurations we could imagine. So conclusion so far is that entanglement is too sparse in three dimensions. You know, there are too many degrees of freedom and local individual degrees of freedom are not entangled. One needs to include many more. I don't know if infinite or, you know, I don't know where the cutoff is, how many degrees of freedom we need. But, you know, even here, thousand or, or this, that, you know, these are two systems with a lot of contact between them, you know, you know three layers you know, with around, you know, almost 3000 degrees of freedom in total, no entanglement. So degrees of freedom, uh, you know, entanglement must be there, but it's too diluted. The sitter, uh, uh, the sitter, you know, calculation is more subtle because infrared issues, but uh, uh, one can prove analytically, uh, and Patrice has, has done it, that lock neck is not infrared divergent. Is uh, you know it's independent. You can put a cutoff, and lock neck is independent of the cutoff. So that is a very nice uh, analytical result, and we find no entanglement at all, uh, either in the sitter using individual degrees of freedom. So entanglement. There is more correlations in the sitter at super Hubble distances, but no entanglement. Uh, uh, you know, in the systems we have been able to explore so far. So entanglement is as sparse, or perhaps more, because in fact, mathematical calculations indicate that we are even farther away <laughs> from getting entanglement than in Minkowski uh, in a concrete, precise manner. Um, um, um. So it, the sitter has more and more correlations, but, but, but at least in this sense, no more entanglement than Minkowski. And um, I have a small section about particle detectors, uh, which is interesting, but, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip it. Uh, 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 I, I just leave the title here, so in case you want to ask and, and you want to discuss this, because this is an interesting part. Um, uh, but uh, um, in the interest of time, let me just skip that part. And you know, conclusions, entanglement is ubiquitous in quantum field theory, but it's distributed in a very subtle manner. It can be found, uh, as far as I understand, by either involving infinitely many degrees of freedom, something experimentally impossible, or carefully selecting the degrees of freedom. Uh, you know, uh, if you really fine tune the degrees of freedom and you allow them to be expanded in huge, you know, cosmological distances, you may be able to catch that, but that is experimentally difficult, if not, not impossible. Uh, uh, 
Smear fields in real space, the ones that we measure around us, do not seem to be entanglement. Entanglement is not strong enough to manifest in, in, in these observables. In the sitter, we find more correlations, but they do not contain entanglement. In fact, it seems that the other way around, that these classical correlations overshine uh, entanglement. So this seems to indicate that it is quite unlikely that we will find entanglement in the primordial perturbations, unless you know, we have non-Gaussianity or something that brings them up. Uh, uh, for the free field theories uh, we have explored, um, entanglement is, 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 is difficult to catch. And, and I think I'm going to stop here and we can, we can discuss about any of these points. All right, thanks. Thanks, Ivan, for this talk. Um, if people want to ask questions, they can raise hands in the, in the chat. So we have a whole bunch of hands. Let's start with Eugenio, Eugenio Bianchi. Yeah, hi, hi everybody. Uh, thank you, Ivan. This is fantastic. This is really interesting. I want to understand better what is this, um, uh, what is the physical interpretation of this measure of entanglement that you're using? Uh, 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 yeah, you, you explained uh, what is the quantity computed, uh, but can you give us a picture? Like uh, when one speaks about bell inequalities, uh, one gives a clear picture of what would be the uh, procedure to uh, to check if there's entanglement. Uh, what is this quantity that you're using? You're not using the mutual information, as you said. Uh, can, can you tell us more? Right, right. So, I mean, um, 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 it's a very good question and very good point to discuss, which I myself wonder <laughs> every single day, you know. In, as you know, in quantum information, we have all these possible measures of entanglement and, and that, that are derived mathematically. And then, of course, the question is how to, you know, how to make that operational, you know, how to give an operational meaning to, to measures of entanglement, and in particular to, to, to lock uh, negativity. So um, uh, um, um, log negativity is nice, as I emphasize, because it's, it's easy to compute. And for many situations, it is an if and only if, you know, it is different from zero if and only if there is entanglement and it grows monotonically with entanglement. So that is, that is wonderful. It is not simple to obtain a measure like that, although it's only true for, for some systems. Uh, uh, what is the operational meaning? So, so far people have been uh, able to give two operational meanings. One is that um, um, it is uh, in a precise concrete sense, it is uh, uh, a measure of entanglement cost. Entanglement cost is defined as the number of EBITs, <laughs> you know, an EBIT is the entanglement included in a bell pair. So how many bell pairs you need to, to generate, you know, together with, with, with law operations and classical communication, uh, you need to generate a state uh, uh, which looks like that with high fidelity. <laughs> Uh, uh, so, so it is, has been established uh, log negativity is equal to entanglement cost in a concrete manner. So, so the operational meaning is how much entangle bits, you know, how much uh, uh, bell pairs you need to create uh, uh, a state like that uh, with high fidelity. Um, um, uh, that is the rough idea. Of course, there are mathematical details. <laughs> uh, uh, Another uh, operational meaning is that it is an upper bound for uh, distillable entanglement. Uh, what I said before was for Gaussian states, by the way. Uh, uh, but in general, it is an upper bound for uh, uh, distillable entanglement. How much entanglement you can distill? I mean, in, distillable entanglement is the contrary of entanglement cost. Is, Distillable entanglement is how much entanglement, how much bell pairs you can extract from the state by doing uh, local operations and classical communications. Uh, uh, and this is the two uh, operational meanings uh, that have been derived uh, for log negativity as far as I know, which I think is very interesting and, 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 and a strong arguments, right? Uh, 
I see. Thank you. Uh, and uh, uh, so I, I understand that the result is uh, for this uh, specific subalgebra of observables. Uh, uh, do you expect that all uh, uh, finitely generated uh, local subalgebras have this property? Is that intuition that you are gaining from this, uh, that you have to go either completely non local, like Fourier modes, or uh, uh, region, but infinitely many degrees of freedom? That's the intuition I have, uh, but but so far is is my guess based on our finite calculations, <laughs> right? We are able to include so many degrees of freedom just because computational power, right? Uh, you need to compute the covariance matrix, you need to find the synthetic eigenvalues, compute log negativity, and you know, and there is a maximum number of degrees of freedom that I see, but. The reason why I show this one-dimensional, two-dimensional space, three-dimensional space, and see how entanglement gets diluted more and more was to emphasize my intuition that um, I think the more space dimensions you have, the more diluted is entanglement. And my guess is precisely what you have said. Either you need non-local degrees of freedom or a large number, perhaps infinity. <laughs> that, that, that's intuition so far. Really interesting. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, Toby Haas. Yes, thanks. So uh, first, first of all, thanks a lot for this very nice talk. It was really nice results also. And um, my question is also related to the entanglement measure you used. So I wondered if it would be useful to use the relative entropy of entanglement because it's it's especially related to the mutual information, which is, has been used a lot in the quantum field theory like uh, literature right so I, I guess you already thought about that what were the possible reasons against it right thank you for the question um, right uh, mutual information is a very nice measure of correlations that that it doesn't signal entanglement necessarily yes true right so so mutual information give you information about total correlations but they can be purely classical with no entanglement so uh, why did i choose log negativity it's because for uh, these uh, simple systems gaussian states and whenever one subsystem is a single degree of freedom i know that if log negativity is different from zero there is entanglement necessarily uh, uh, and if it is zero, there is no entanglement, you know, it's if and only it. So, and it's easy to compute. <laughs> that is the way, that is the reason why I choose log negativity, not because I think physical is better than relative entropy or anything, it's just because uh, 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 these nice properties. But of course, uh, uh, it would be uh, uh, very interesting to compute other, other measures and see, and see what happens. Um, uh, but to measure, you know, if we want to discuss entanglement, I would make sure whatever we choose uh, 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 is a good indicator of, of entanglement and not of something something else. Yeah, that's that's why I said like relative entropy of entanglement could be interesting. I mean, if you restrict to pure states, it reduces to mutual information. But if you have mixed states, as in your setup, it's it's really also a measure, so non-zero if and only if. And so what I know is that if you have only Gaussian states, then there are also simple formulas to compute it from two-point correlation functions. So it should be equally easy to compute it. Thank you, wonderful suggestion. Wonderful, thank you. So you have to, you have to look in um, lecture notes by Mark Wilde. There you can find it. Mark Wilde, he's, he was in LSU until last year. So I know him very well. <laughs> Okay, yes. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> Marius? Okay, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, thank you for the very nice talk, Van. Uh, it's very interesting. I have a, a sort of journalistic question just to see if I, uh, if I get right the, the statement. So, um, are you saying that uh, maybe let's say in the vacuum state of a uh, quantum field theory, what we mean by entanglement is some sort of in principle observable, but if you actually take into account the finite precision and everything, how we do science, 
actually there isn't the possibility to see, to observe entanglement at all. Yes, that is that is that is possible. Even though you know there is this section I didn't go through about particle detectors that, that uh, people claim that with particle detectors, you can harvest entanglement in a precise manner. I so, are you saying that wrong? All the story I, about I have, the Right, I have some uh, reservations about that. I don't want to say it's wrong because I haven't proved it. But, but, um, um, the, but, but, but I have some reservations because if they are harvesting entanglement, I still don't understand where that entanglement is coming from. And that was the discussion I skipped. Uh, would, you like to, because, would you like to open the slides? I, 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 about I, slides. Uh, if, Thanks. If the boss allows me, uh, Andrea is the boss. So <laughs> of course. Then, <laughs> uh, 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 right. Uh, um, so, uh, uh, you know, particle detectors are, you know, uh, uh, you know, it's just a, a qubit system, a very simple quantum mechanical system with two energy levels, ground state and excited, that we couple to the field. And we couple it uh, uh, you know, in this manner. So there is a coupling constant. This is Hamiltonian interaction. Uh, coupling constant, a switching function that tells you when you switch on the detector and when you switch it off the special resolution of the detector which is this f give you you know the sensitivity of the detector uh, an operator of the detector which allows you know transitions from ground to excited and vice versa and the field this is the interaction but of course you can integrate in x <laughs> you know this x integral x function the field and this just becomes an interaction between sorry an interaction between the detector and the smear field, exactly the same smear field I had before, where now the smearing is given by the detector. The problem with this is that this is a non-local interaction. Uh, this breaks locality because you have a detector, single degree of freedom, which feels instantaneously what happens in the field in a, in a finite region. So, so the detector is sensitive to you know, to what happens in the field in, in an extended space uh, space region. So this is a non-local theory. Uh, therefore, one has to be careful. Uh, I, don't, I don't want to say that therefore everything is wrong, just that this is one point uh, to, to keep in mind. And the statement, uh, uh, this is where I had, uh, you know, something I don't understand is that if you have two such detectors, A and B or one and two, one interact, you know, one feels this degree of freedom of the field, two feels this other one, the detectors get entangled, but the field degrees of freedom are not entangled, as I show you. So my question is, where is this entanglement coming from? This is something I don't understand. Uh, I don't want to say more than that, <laughs> simply that I don't understand where this harvested entanglement by the detectors is really coming from. Because the field, two degrees of freedom are not entangled. Is this an artifact of some causality violations or some issues? I don't know. Uh, 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 it is coming from somewhere which I, I cannot see. I don't know. That was, that was my, my comment. Um. I will take the chance to ask a question now. Um, I, 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 I don't know much about entanglement in quantum field theory, but recently I was studying a paper about it and there was a big talk about uh, entanglement entropy being related to the, to the area of a region. So you, you, take, you look at the, at the state inside the, inside the region of space time and you look at the area of this region and somehow by putting a in UV cutoff, you, you could compute a finite number for this, which is proportional somehow to the area. So I'm interested because you were saying perhaps you need an infinite amount of degrees of freedom to see the entanglement, but in these computations, they do put a cutoff. Right, and, they put uh, a cutoff in subsystem A, but subsystem right, B in only is one system. still, still, still contains infinite. infinite degrees of freedom. Right, 
And there have been no computations, for example, with two concentric shells or something like that. Like, right. I mean, this this calculation uh, 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 was done uh, very nicely by by Eugenio and Alejandro Satz. Uh, and what they did was consider region A and consider a family of smearing functions, orthogonal smearing functions with compact support inside the region. Each smearing function gives you a new degree of freedom of the field. So they were, they were computing how entanglement entropy uh, changes as you increase the number of degrees of freedom within region A in this very well-defined mathematical manner. And they were observing that, um, uh, that the entropy diverges uh, as you send the number of degrees of freedom to infinity, that in a, diverges in a concrete manner where the area of the region uh, uh, can be factorized in a, in a concrete mm -hmm. manner. But, but still, so system A has finite number of degrees of freedom, but B has infinite limit. And also, if you truncate so system A, this entanglement entropy measures entanglement between those degrees of freedom and the rest. And the rest, some of them are outside and some of them are inside. So mm -hmm. at any finite truncation, you know, you are computing entanglement between degrees of freedom within region A, not only between A and the exterior, uh, uh, right? Um, um. Okay, thanks, that makes, that makes sense. Uh, we have a question by Ding, Ding Jia. Hi, Ivan. Um, I, th I think I'm missing something very important um, uh, about the detectors. Um, first of all, I like what you said uh, because I, I want to find, find this statement fishy that people say using detectors one could uh, harvest entanglement because uh, if you look at the numbers for their calculations that very small so something like 10 to the minus 7, 17 in their papers so, so practically it's zero uh, and now what I what I, I think the, the important thing I missed from what you said is uh, uh, it seems you're saying it's exactly zero is that right is that what you're saying I, 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 I am not saying I, I don't want to say it is zero I just say that if it is different from zero, um, I would like to understand better <laughs> where that entanglement comes from. Yeah, maybe, maybe that's the that's an important point of your talk that I missed. So you say the field is not entangled. For, for the... The, the field degrees of freedom, which are which the detectors are coupled to, are not entangled. Therefore, <laughs> I don't know where what detectors are harvesting. Uh, uh, um. That is, that is my question. Like What's a question? I am, not, I am not saying it is it's a question. I don't understand where, what detectors are harvesting. Um. So, uh, this, well, they did some calculations, right? So there must be, it's a concrete calculation, step-by-step -step calculation. So but in fact, I, I, all we also did the calculations, right? We did it. We did the we also did the calculations, right. and uh, I didn't show plots, but I have plots for entanglement harvesting uh, computed by S. And mathematical is different from zero, so I agree that this calculation gives you a different number, different from zero. But uh, uh, you know, physically, I don't. I, I think the result should be the result should be zero. So. Is there anything in this calculation I cannot trust? Um, uh, one point is this non-locality. Um, uh, is non-locality creating this fake entanglement? I don't know. I don't want to say that. <laughs> uh, could be. Uh, I just say that I agree that the calculation gives you entanglement, but I think it shouldn't. <laughs> uh, uh, either I am wrong <laughs> or, or and I am missing something that is perfectly possible. Or, and when I say I, I mean myself and my collaborators, of course, um, and, or that there is something funny uh, in the calculation. I like what you said. That's very interesting. Thank you. Uh, we had Pablo, Pablo Rigue. Hello. So I just missed uh, one one bit of the talk, maybe, uh, which is in what model are we? I mean, you were speaking about uh, quantum field theory, but which one is it, and which state? I mean, is it is it um, a ground state of which quantum field theory? Sorry. 
thank you, thank you. Uh, maybe I said too fast. Um, and for two dimensions and three dimensions, uh, what I have shown is the simplest field theory you can imagine, uh, uh, because you know just to emphasize that that um, uh, it's a free theory. So this is a free theory, and it's massless theory because then we can do the calculations analytically. We can do also massive theories, yes, but but then we have to do it numerically. In one dimension, we did numerically for a mass massive theory, and the state is the Minkowski vacuum. Uh, of course, you can have interactions, uh, non gaussianity you know, you can, you can enrich the theory and ask, you know, whether extra physics uh, uh, increases the entanglement budget. But, but I think, you know, I think the first step is to look for this simplest uh, theory. And so can I understand this as, as a veil particle or several veil particles? Uh, this is a scalar, a scalar field. So real, real. Ah, so you say it's a Klein-Gordon particle? Exactly, Klein-Gordon massless particle or massive, uh, and there are there are as many as we want, or just one. The state is in the vacuum. The state is the ground state of the Hamiltonian in Minkowski spacetime. Ah, okay. Or, or the Banks Davis vacuum in in the sitter. Uh, uh, um, if you put one particle, nothing is going to change. Uh, uh, you know, you can you can populate the vacuum, but. But if you don't entangle the particles that you put, um, I don't think. But don't you think that just the mere fact of having a charged particle and therefore having um, a field around it will immediately uh, trigger something? Um, um, I haven't done the calculations, but I don't think so, because you are just adding one excitation, which is not entangled with anything else. So my intuition is that nothing is going to change if you add a single particle or two or three, unless you entangle them uh, by hand. Okay. That's, that's my intuition. Thanks. Uh, Kia. Hey, um, <clears throat> thanks for the talk. So I'm trying to listen better uh, the fact that you're not seeing entanglement, right? And I wonder if maybe you can help uh, with my intuition of why maybe that's not the case. So let's forget the field case calculation. Let's go to find dimensional Hilbert space. Imagine that you have like a generalized GHZ state for an um, n-partite quantum system. Uh, so you have this maxly entangled state for all the systems. As soon as you trace out a single um, degree of freedom, automatically you have a mixture, right? Right. Um, so, so in the fine-dimensional dimension, fine case, not a surprise that the, regardless of how much entanglement you have in a gigantic quantum system, by just not being able to look to one particular site of your system, you only have now uh, classical correlations. So now let's go to your example. Um, can, from can, my, I, can I yeah? add something to this point in particular? Yeah. So, so, so uh, absolutely true. And, you know, we can see that in, in quantum field theory. If yeah. you consider the reduced state of these two degrees of freedom, the state is mixed yeah. because you have lost entanglement with, with, the, with other degrees of freedom, which are purifying uh, your yeah. system, therefore the state is mixed. But, but a mixed state has entanglement on it. I mean, uh, it's true that you are you have quant classical correlations, but still uh, uh, you can trace and still have an entangled state. Sure, but like, yeah, yeah, of right. course. But that's why I'm thinking about a uh, generalized GHZ state because if you have a maximally entangled state, then your reduced dense matrix is going to be just a, a, a mixed uh, uh, this, it, this in matrix. In that right? case, of course, yeah. because because and, this guy is entangled only with that guy. <laughs> Sorry. So if you trace, you lose all entanglement. Yeah, but, but what I'm saying, like, imagine you have like n partite system. So it's not only that guy. You have like, let's say, up, 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 n ups plus down, 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 n downs. As soon as you trace out what, just one of them, you have actually a mixture. And so going back to your with the field example. Um, Usually I tend to think intuitively about having this uh, infinite amount of entanglement because you have all those different Fourier modes which are entangled. But when you have this mirroring function, I would imagine that somehow it is as, almost as if you are introducing the Fourier uh, space, a sort of cutoff. So you're not considering the full extent of your Fourier modes. 
So to some extent, it is as if you're tracing out, I guess, uh, some sort of like deep UV degrees of freedom. And so if you were to model now uh, the momentum space and position space in terms of like some generalized poly operators, so bringing everything to fine dimensional Hilbert space, this mirroring would be, I think, the equivalent of tracing out um, yes, some absolutely. UV degrees of freedom. But if you have all of them maxed and entangled in the same case of having like spin in a generalized GHZ state maxed and entangled, by just tracing out a single degree of freedom, automatically actually you uh, have a, a completely mixed um, uh, density matrix. So somehow then in that case, I wouldn't be so surprised that unless you have access to all the degrees of freedom of your system, regardless of being a fine dimensional or infinite dimensional quantum system, you'd end in the end by not seeing a single site or a single part of your Hilbert space, actually observe only um, uh, uh, a mixture. Right. So yeah, I don't right. know, I'm not so, sure if um, the, this intuition follows or not, but I'm just trying to understand yeah. better. I understand, uh, you... I understand your intuition, uh, um, but I will add something which I believe is crucial. Mm -hmm. First of all, uh, um, uh, in several things. The first thing is that the intuition with a finite dimensional system uh, is tricky because mm -hmm. uh, uh, entanglement has an upper bound in, in a finite dimensional Hilbert space. Mm -hmm. And this is where the monogamy appears, right? If you are maximally entangled with this, you cannot be entangle, entangled at all with anybody else. Mm -hmm. But in a bosonic theory, the Hilbert space is, even, even for a single harmonic oscillator or two, the Hilbert space is infinite dimensional and entanglement entropy is not bounded from above. Mm -hmm. So entanglement can be as large as, as, as you want. Mm -hmm. um, second, it is true. Imagine I have, uh, you know, that, uh, let me do an example. Three oscillators and there is entanglement between them in a pure state. You can trace one of them. And then of course the system becomes mixed, mm -hmm. but still entanglement can remain between the two remaining guys. There are many examples that, that you can see that explicitly. You are losing some entanglement, and th that is why the state is mixed. But mix doesn't mean you have lost entanglement. Mm -hmm. uh, it's only you only lose entanglement if you know this in this concrete case you had in your intuition, which is a maximally entangled state in a finite dimensional qubit system. <laughs> Uh, in a, for harmonic oscillators, tracing creates entropy, you know, mixedness, but you don't lose necessarily all entanglement. So in field theory, I, I agree. In field theory, by a meeting, you trace out infinitely many degrees of freedom. <laughs> yeah. And, but, you know, the example of one and two dimensional space time uh, is concrete examples where entanglement remains between the finite degrees of freedom you can measure. So that is two examples in which tracing out, you get two degrees of freedom which are entangled. Uh, mm -hmm. The point is that, uh, so entanglement is enough <laughs> to remain after tracing. In three dimensions, it's not. What, that, that is what, what, what we find. And that I find that surprising. I didn't know uh, uh, what was gonna happen. And in, in three dimensions, Entanglement is not strong enough to remain after you truncate. Uh, I, I don't think that is that is that is intuitively obvious either way. Could be could be either way uh, intuitively. And Actually, happens to be that there is no entanglement. Do, do you have do you have any intuition for that? Because you said you are doing everything with a free theory, so uh, somehow I wouldn't imagine that dimensionality would be relevant whatsoever in general. I mean, dimensionality of the Hilbert space, right? The Hilbert space is, is infinite dimensional. No, no, but the, the, because you're saying, you're, when you say like three dimensional, you mean, you, you're talking oh, about- right, I see. Okay, dimensionality of a space, sorry. Exactly. Uh, I mean, the intuition, I again, intuition, no more than that, is that, you know, you have more dimensions and many more degrees of freedom, even if they are infinite, <laughs> Uh, 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 for entanglement to dissipate, right? Entanglement can be distributed in three dimensions much more than in one dimension uh, because, you know, the, the three-dimensionality of the space. So my intuition is that there is entanglement between the field theory as a whole, but entanglement is distributed so much that pairwise entanglement is absent. So you really need big chunks of degrees of freedom. You need, I don't know, 10,000 millions and 10,000 millions 
to catch entanglement. Uh, entanglement is too diluted. I mean, and my intuition comes from, from uh, harmonic oscillators. <laughs> you know, if you have a bunch of oscillators and you start entangling them, you know, globally, that, you know, for instance, 100 and 100, and, and, and you entangle the two systems. Mm -hmm. There are many examples that even though there is entanglement between 100 and 100, pairwise, if you focus on one one, there is no entanglement for any pair. However, there is global entanglement. Mm -hmm. So global entanglement doesn't mean that the constituents are entangled. And there are many examples like that. Entanglement is tricky, right? Global entanglement between this junk and this junk doesn't imply that individually you are going to fight entanglement. And that is where my intuition is coming from. Thanks. We have uh, Anishat. Yeah, thanks uh, for the talk. It's very, very interesting. I just have like two silly questions. Um, like one is, uh, I assume that the results do not depend specifically on the family of uh, smearing functions that that you consider that if you would pick a different family, you would expect the same results? Answer is yes. We, I mean, we have choose different families as, as, as far as we can do calculations. And of course the numbers change uh, because you know, log negativity depends on the function that you consider, but the trends do not. Okay. And the second question is also like if, instead of considering the scalar field, you consider fermionic fields or gauge fields if you expect different behavior or it's the properties of having uh, a configuration space, which is 3D is the thing that it's giving you these results and not the specific uh, commutation relations of the field or, or anything like that. This is an interesting question. I, I would expect, uh, um, expect. <laughs> I, I don't know this. We haven't done the calculations for fermionic fields, but I would expect that for fermions it's going to be even worse to catch entanglement because mm -hmm. you know individual degrees of freedoms are qubits, mm -hmm. uh, 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 and therefore you know the monogamy of entanglement <laughs> uh, makes things uh, much worse, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, the entanglement of a single degree of freedom is bounded by the dimensionality of the Hilbert space and. And, and I think that is going to make things worse for fermions. Makes sense. And for a gauge field, uh, like the electromagnetic field, do you expect any change with respect to the scalar field calculations? Or? No, I don't. I, I think right. the bosonic approach, um, I, I, don't, I, I don't expect. I would be very surprised. OK, thank you. Thank you for the question. It's interesting. Toby has a, a design up for a while. No, please, please, somebody else can go first because I have uh, three more questions. So, please. Then there is Ibai Asensio. Hello, thank you, Ivan, for the great talk. Very nice to follow. Uh, you said you haven't found entanglement in the sitter. Is that in any dim dimensionality? Three plus one. And yeah, uh, and I was, I was I was thinking about inflation. You know, I was. Yeah, and the motivation was to look what happens in the real early universe. This is why I focus on three plus one. Okay, and is there any intuition on why it can be more difficult than in Minkowski? Because I, I think you mentioned that. Right, I mentioned that there are stronger correlations. Uh, uh, you know, in the sitter, it is well known that in the Bunch Davis vacuum, the two point correlation function. Uh, uh, you know, that if you start separating the points, falls off as one over distance square, as in Minkowski. But once you increase the Hubble radius, uh, the correlations freeze and don't fall off anymore in the sitter. In Minkowski, they will keep decreasing, <laughs> but in the sitter, they do not. So the Weiss Davis vacuum has a stronger correlations at long distances than in, than in Minkowski. And and um, uh, the intuition would be, oh, more correlations, maybe more entanglement, uh, uh, but actually not. Even in the mathematics, you see that these correlations seem to be mathematically fighting against <laughs> entanglement. Uh, um, uh, but I say this, you know, in, a, in this manner because it's not 
there is zero entanglement. So, so it's meaningless to say that there is less entanglement than in Minkowski. But just mathematically, you see that the terms coming from these correlations give you, you know, bring you farther away from entanglement than in Minkowski. And, and, and I don't have any other, any stronger intuition than, than that. Okay, I see. And in the situation with the with the particle detectors, uh, when you say the field is not entangled, is is that it's not that it isn't at all, right? Is that it's too sparse to capture? Maybe the harvesting mechanism is able somehow to do it, or right, right. No, no, that, that that's a very a very a very good viewpoint. In fact, this was my viewpoint, <laughs> and I said, oh, maybe. Uh, but if I go to the calculation, I see that each detector is coupled only to a single degree of freedom of the field. Uh, the one defined by the smithing function characterizing the detector. Uh, so I, I, you know, I, I, had, I had trying to look this for different viewpoints. And the more I look at it, uh, I, I, don't, I don't understand where entanglement comes from. Because each detector is coupled only to one degree of freedom of the field. And those two degrees of freedom are not entangled. So, so, so I don't see, I don't understand where this entanglement is coming from at this point. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Then maybe Pablo again. Yeah. So. So if I take um, uh, seriously your conclusions, then it seems that, uh, you know, going back to the motivations, it seems we shouldn't be looking for quantumness in the CMB uh, background as two point uh, functions. So, but that leaves open the idea that uh, there could be entanglement that is a more global thing, like uh, you would have in a W state or GH, GHZ state? Um, yes, yes, uh, 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 absolutely. The conclusions are just what they are. Um, um, and of course, this is a free theory. Um, in the early universe, we could have non Gaussianity. That we haven't seen them yet, but they could be there and they could somehow enhance the non Gaussian the, the entanglement. So absolutely right. The, uh, this is why in my conclusions I said indicates, <laughs> I you know indicates that the CMB there is no entanglement in the CMB. Um, uh, but if I have to bet, I would say this is this is a strong indication. Something something important must happen to change this conclusion radically. And there is no indication that such thing such thing happens. Non Gaussianities are very small. Uh, uh, um, and I am not speaking about whatever decoherence is happening between inflation and today. That that is also gonna gonna if there is entanglement initially present, that is gonna be further diluted. Mm -hmm. uh, so so even in the best case scenario where there is no decoherence, these calculations indicate that you need a new big ingredient <laughs> in your theory to make entanglement visible. Okay. Toby, are you ready now? I'm, I'm always ready. It's rather that <laughs> I don't want to waste so much time. There's another person uh, also that has their hands raised, Motasem Hassan. Uh, yes. Um, so I had a question. Um, you showed um, that there was uh, from lattice field theory that uh, in the two plus one dimension that they 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 have measured entanglement. Um, is there a similar kind of calculation for three plus one uh, in lattice field theory? Or and if there isn't, do we expect that um, that would be that it would measure entanglement entropy in three plus one? Right. So uh, in the paper of the authors, I mentioned uh, they. They didn't do explicitly, as far as I know, the calculation for three plus one, but they had a way to guess what this exponential decay should be in three plus one. So they were guessing that in three plus one, you could also see entanglement, 
but falls off faster than in two plus one. Uh, we find that in the continuous theory, once, once you build your lattice doing a smearing, which I think is the, the right thing, uh, in, two plus D, in two plus one, entanglements falls off faster than in lattice. And in three plus one, we find no entanglement. So, so, um, so, 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 your answer, to, your answer, to your question, yes, they, uh, they, don't, they, they don't compute it, but they guess it. Uh, by extrapolation, and we find something else. Thank you. Okay, Toby. All right. <laughs> so, um, as I said, I have three uh, questions slash also comments. Um, the first is related to, at some point you have shown in the one plus one dimensional setup or one plus two, I don't remember, some periodic um, bipartition that you have like many of these circles, right? And mm -hmm. I have a comment and a question to that. So first, do you know this paper by um, He, Magan and Vandoren? It's, um, it's called Entanglement Entropy of Periodic Sublattices. And what they find there is that if you take periodic boundary conditions, so simply a ring of oscillators and do exactly the same as you did, only consider periodic um, subsystems, that then the two-point correlation functions, which are anyway triplets matrices in the lattice theory, reduce to circulant matrix matrices and you can compute everything analytically. So they have analytic results for that and you may compare with this and um, the, the second point is that if you I, try, I, I didn't know about I didn't know about that um, that paper. Um, um, I didn't know. Uh, just one comment is that you know our calculations are analytic also in in two yeah. plus one for all the configurations we have we have open. They are, they are complicated. You don't want to see them. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I'll I'll take a look to the to the paper you mentioned. Can you say again one of the authors, Magan? Um, maybe since, so I will also say other stuff about papers. If you don't mind, I will simply send you a mail with papers later. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful, thank you. <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> um, thank you. All right, so directly to this point, have you tried to do something similar in the, in the three plus one dimensional setup? So having something like a ball surrounded by a shell of balls and then another shell of balls, another shell of balls, I guess, you, and it didn't work either? Oh, work okay. We have tried all possible arrangements you can imagine, you know, using, you know, this using the maximal, maximally compact uh, 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 arrangement of spheres, you know, mathematicians mm -hmm. know how to you know, put the spheres in the closest manner. Uh, you know, we haven't found, we haven't found any, any entanglement, even having different layers, you know, one layer of blue, one layer mm -hmm. of the other, one other layer. No. Okay, interesting. Then the, the second block, so to say, um, it's about, the regularization dependence. Namely, if you simply consider, for example, a two-dimensional lattice and you want to compute the entanglement entropy of a square, then because the lattice breaks the symmetries of the uh, continuous field theory, it really depends how the square is oriented and you get a different result for the entanglement entropy. Or more generally, many entanglement measures are not robust against changing the regularization scheme. So do you know something about the logarithmic negativity here? So do you expect that it's robust enough or something like that? Right. So um, the way I like to see this is that um, in a lattice field theory by hand, you say that degrees of freedom only exist at vertices, right? Mm -hmm. So you change the theory quite a lot. All the continuous field theory goes away and you have this discrete. Uh, with these meetings, you can see them as a way of creating a lattice field theory out of a continuous theory, right? So in each pixel, you have a meeting function and you, you choose a single degree of freedom of that in that region. 
and the same for the other pixel, the same for the other pixel. And, and however, you know, so in that sense, uh, you are, you know, reducing your theory to a lattice theory, but in a control manner, right? Starting from the, without missing any, anything because, because you have the full theory behind that. But of course, the degrees of freedom that you choose depend on the smearing. And you can choose different smearing functions and that will fish different degrees of freedom. And the log negativity is gonna depend on that. The number you get is gonna depend on that. The examples I show was these different curves for different deltas. Different deltas correspond to different smearing functions. And we find that the value of log negativity is different. And that is natural because you know, there are many ways of extracting a degree of freedom from, from a field. This is why you know, we have tried many different functions, as many as we could, and focus on trends rather than on con concrete values. So how log negativity depends on distance, how it depends on the number of degrees of freedom. You know, just trying to extract what is universal and, and from what depends from the concrete lattice, if you want, that we are building using meetings. So I guess you have also observed something like some monotonic behavior that if you include more modes that then it grows somehow or something something like this, I guess. Right. For instance, in this in this example that you mentioned at the beginning of this change, blue orange, blue orange, blue orange, blue orange, uh, uh, we see that the log negativity grows uh, uh, with the number of degrees of freedom. Uh, yes. Uh, okay. Good. Yeah. Okay. And then the the third part is like a bit actually going more in, a, in an experimental direction, going more into the direction you had your motivation on. That is. I think it's very important to ask the questions you ask, not only on our actual universe, but especially also on analog systems. So I don't know if you also work in this direction or not, but I've been working a bit on um, simulating cosmological particle production in a Bose-Einstein condensate. And many, many of the features you discussed here are present already there. And our, our paper will, um, will appear very soon in, uh, so it's on archive already. And there we have, sorry, what? No, no, <laughs> that, that, that I am also very interested in that. And in fact, I am also working on, on the same system. Ah, yeah, okay, uh, okay, good. And what, what, and, uh, yes, and, and from that perspective, I wanted to give a few comments on measurability because this um, was a joint project with an experimental group and we also had experimental results. And the first thing is that for the smearing function, because in this analogy, we basically have at the end, we describe the phonons, right, which are massless. And we also need some kind of smearing functions, otherwise all correlation functions would diverge. Right. Um, and we took a Gaussian and not something, I mean, what you took is basically, if I'm not completely wrong, something like a student T distribution with a cutoff. And I simply, I, I guess you also check Gaussian, but I simply want to say that we use the Gaussian because the lenses and the, the imaging apparatus had something like a Gaussian profile. So this was also like an uh, experimental uh, yeah, input, so to say. Can I, Thank can you. I jump in and just add a comment? Sorry, sorry, Ivan, about the Gaussian. Just because we try to, and there's uh, there's a catch that I see with the Gaussian. It has tails. So if you do as uh, Ivan is doing with two regions, there's a small overlap that in most cases is negligible and one doesn't worry about that. Uh, but there are uh, exact results that one expects, for instance, for uh, relative entropy that are just violated by those tails. Uh, so just as something to keep in mind uh, when, uh, when working with Gaussians and not with bump functions or compact support. Fully agree. Yes, yes. And um... uh, 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 thank you. Thank you for the comment, because in fact, I am, I am very, I'm working actively in the last year or two on analog, analog models, in different analog models and focusing on entanglement in particular. And I am 
paper on on expanding the expansion of the universe, and I would be very eager to read your paper <laughs> to see, uh, and I may contact you to discuss more. So maybe, so there, there are two more things related to this I wanted to, to add. The first is that I was very surprised by the experimental precision. So they could really measure correlation functions in spatial regions to a very high precision. And I think that trying to build the right theoretical methods and so on to make predictions for how much entang spatial entanglement between such smeared out fields in such analog models, because this is really then cosmology again, but this is really a good way to go. And then I can imagine that your methods would really apply there quite fast and that you may find some experimental group trying to yeah, look for this stuff. And, um, and the second point is that to one question you have responded that you believe what you have seen is not so much related to that you have a vacuum state, but honestly, I personally doubt that. So I could imagine that if you, for example, have such an expanding scenario where particles are being created, 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 that you may find entanglement in, in scenarios you currently haven't found any. Absolutely. But that is a very special state. This is not... Yes. Right. This is a volume of transformation of the vacuum. Um, yes. Or a, a two-mode two squeeze vacuum. And of course, in that case, I fully agree. Uh, you are increasing entanglement. But, but I, was, I was referring to simple states that you put one yes, particle. Sure, sure. So I fully agree with you. Yeah, it's, the, the, only, the only reason why I'm saying this explicitly is because I think that this could be like what saves us from saying that we cannot do anything with CMB or analog experiments. Because I, I personally believe that if we look at these inflatory dynamics, then there, there is something to measure, which is only quantum. So I, I'm very optimistic there. Wonderful. Thank you for the comments. They are very good comments. And I, I, I'll contact you to talk more. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks a lot again for your talk. Great. Um, Ivan, if you have energy for one last question, then we okay. can stop the live. Uh, sorry for the last question, uh, but I couldn't resist. Um, I just wanted to, to resonate a bit on what Pablo Arigui said. Um, that is what you have considered, it's uh, bipartitions, right? So you have considered on, like only two systems, um, but maybe you could try to fish uh, for like uh, three-partite or like multi-partite entanglement, uh, where the dilution is no like the tracing out, it's not as severe and maybe you could fish the, the entanglement there or do you have some intuition why that would not work? No, no, um, I mean, um, uh, multi-partite entanglement, A, B and C, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's interesting. The only thing uh, I haven't looked into that so much is because my understanding is that how to quantify entanglement in these multi-systems is an open question. That uh, so um, that that and therefore you know <laughs> uh, before that is uh, uh, settled down, I still don't know how to do it. But this is why you know I consider two uh, uh, just to have a bipartite, but including more and more degrees of freedom in each of them, trying to alleviate this trace out, <laughs> uh, trying to to so. Um, uh, and and also because it's you know it's simpler and it's, it's, it's interesting. So, but in multipartite, I I I'm not sure if people agree on how to quantify entanglement in a in a concrete manner. Makes sense. Like the configurations. Sorry, like uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm expanding uh, my time. But like uh, the configurations that uh, you have uh, tried, are they uh, like more or less compact or? Like, because it's different to add more degrees of freedom on a compact surface, right? Than just to put, put a bunch of holes that alternate uh, each other or something like that, which why it's why I would think that maybe the multipartite case would help uh, with catching the elusive entanglement there. I don't know if that makes sense, what I said. 
with two systems, with two subsystems, we, uh, Patricia tried and she came out with configurations as compact as possible, given for from mathematic, mathematical theorem, you know, how to, you know, put the spheres together in the most compact manner. Mm -hmm. And and we have tried, you know, alternate them, trying to increase as much as possible the contact between the two subsystems. And, we, you know, we have tried and we haven't found. Um, okay, okay. But no, but I was thinking add. like to, to do the opposite, like to find it like non-compact in the sense that um, there is much, uh, like instead of that the system, it's compact in, it, in itself, let's say A, it's a ball, that you try to uh, break it into very small pieces uh, through through the region to maximize the area. I don't know if that's more. Right, that's a, a suggestion. And, and we have tried all what we can at this point, but, but maybe maybe there is there is something something more to do. Um, if I may add, uh, we have tried these kind of configurations that are kind of alternating. So we put things as compact as possible, and then we kind of distribute the degrees of freedom such that they are alternating. And still, we don't find entanglement in this case either. Also, um, you know, in the case <coughs> when we were looking into these more compact configurations of degrees in one system and in the other is because, well, you had in mind something that you can measure somehow. No? And if I have a detector with different pixels, I would say, okay, I can point it in one direction and point it in another direction. And it's difficult to get in real life, I think, these alternating systems. But yeah, still. Makes sense. No, yeah, yeah, but, but very makes sense the answer. Yeah, thank you. All right, so there seem to be no more questions. So. Jonas, in thanking Ivan for this fantastic talk and discussion.